Okay, it's my great privilege to have Hans Sittig uh, finally on the show. Hans and I have been um, trying to get together for a long time. Um, and we're both feeling the pressure of, of time marching on. So it's important if we're going to capture this history for us to capture it now. And I am I just feel, um, you know, a great sense of anticipation to hear what Hans has got to tell us. Because I know he was in from 1975 to 1980, which were really the hottest periods of the war. And um, and so, you know, and I'm friends with lots of other guys in Special Branch. All of them had dealings with Hans at, at one point or another, guys like Mike Norton, etc. And so, Hans, without further ado, brother, thank you so much for your time. Over to you. Well, thank you. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. Um, I was born in 1955 in uh, uh, the German town of Mönchengladbach. Um, but we lived in a village called Hounshof, uh, uh, just outside Mönchengladbach. Um, I was born out of wedlock, which made life complicated, as the community uh, I was born into was uh, very strictly Catholic. So um, my mother and I uh, were shipped off to my aunt in Dortmund, whilst my grandfather decided what to do. What he decided to do was to adopt me. So I became... Uh, his eighth child, and my mother became legally my sister. Um, my grandfather was a local headmaster, and he was a passionate hunter. So as of age six, he used to take me um, on these walks as he was the gamekeeper for uh, the local Baron von Mullenweber of uh, Mullendong Castle. Now, this meant, uh, and you, you don't have this uh, today anymore, um, more than a thousand hectares of traditional oak forest. And there he used to look after the game, uh, be it wild pig or deer or whatever. He also used to organize um, uh, uh, on an annual basis a hunt. Um, in this hunt, the whole village would participate, something like 100 hunters, and they used to shoot uh, pheasants, uh, hares, rabbits, etc. Um so this is where my passion uh, for hunting comes from, uh, is from my grandfather. Right, fast forward to 1968. My mother meets um, a, a, a Rhodesian tobacco farmer of German descent called Lothar Sittig. Um, uh, they marry, and so they want to take me to Africa with them. Uh, so they get permissions from my grandmother. My grandfather had uh, passed away by then. Um, and had to re-adopt me. So even though she was my real mother, she was only my adoptive mother. So yeah, in so December 1969, uh, we arrived in Rhodesia, um, onto the farm in Macheki, and uh, well, it's a bit like boy's own. Uh, my my dad gave me a, 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 a two two four ten combination. Um, we, uh, we, he, he raised uh, uh, German Shepherd dogs. So I was given my own German Shepherd called Nelly. And Nelly and I used to disappear into the copies with this 2 2 4 10 combination. And I used the 2 2 to shoot dussies, rock rabbits, which are sold in a compound for pocket money. And true to my grandfather, um, I only shot doves on the wing which meant initially an, a huge waste of ammunition, but uh, uh, ammunition was free from my dad, so and he didn't mind. And eventually I became quite an expert. You know, I could, every time I shot at a dove in flight, I would, I would shoot the dove. And I learned very quickly, you only shoot for the pot. So whatever doves I shot, my mother used to prepare them. And, you know, they're rather small, so... To make a meal for the uh, for the uh, three of us, I had to shoot at least nine doves, you know. So, <laughs> as you can imagine, I went through a lot of ammunition. Um, on the farm, I also got my uh, um, at thirteen. I got my second passion, which was motorcycling. Um, my dad gave me um, an old Villiers one nine seven, and they they require a lot of upkeep. And anyone who knows old British bikes. Uh, the carburetor is a bitch. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but you, you learn to boil the chain on the stove and, and all this sort of thing. And um, this is where my passion for bikes comes from. Right. Uh, they sent me to boarding school at Merendellas High, uh, Sussex House. And I arrived and of course, I couldn't speak a word of English. 
I was fluent in English in three months, not because I'm any good with languages, but uh, if I didn't know the word for bread, I didn't eat. So, um, but I enjoyed my time there. Um, found that uh, rugby suited my temperament, shall we say. And uh, I, I enjoyed my rugby at, at Marandellis. Uh, it was great. In I left Marandellis um, in 19, uh, end of 1973. I've done my O levels. And uh, my parents felt, uh, even though I wanted to carry on to M level, they, they were, said, no, you've got to do your A's. So they sent me to PE. At PE, I was a boarder at Salou House. And I, I spent the next two years at Prince Edward studying for my A's. Now, the interesting thing here is my dorm at PE, with a few exceptions like myself, everyone ended up in the RLI. Um, some names you, you, you may recall, Doug Cookson was there, Dennis Stoner was there, Ray Farson was there, Anders Osbrook was there, Gavin Harley was there. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and with all these guys, you, you remained lifelong friends. Unfortunately, with Doug, it didn't last that long. And as you may well know, Doug was tragically killed in 1976. Um, I then did my A's. I got four subjects, three of them languages. Um, I, I, I'm good with languages. Um, I speak five languages. And um, that's always uh, done me well in life, you know, um, including Chilapa Lapa. It's how we communicated on the farm. And um, you could communicate um, uh, when interrogating uh, tours later with quite a few of them in Chilapa Lapa. So it meant I didn't need an interpreter. I could also later meet sources without an interpreter because of Chilapa Lapa. So um, having learned that language on the farm did me quite well during the war. I joined the BSAP in, on the 6th of January, 1975, and spent then, as we all do, the next three months in, in depot. Now, for me, depot, in a way, was a dawdle. Um, when, you, um, when you go to a school like PE, uh, discipline, you're used to it, you know, so the, the discipline wasn't a problem. The fitness wasn't a problem. You know, having been a passionate rugby player, that side of it was good. The, the firearms wasn't a problem. Um, I, I was familiar with firearms. I was a pretty good shot. I never made marksman for some reason. Um, but, um, you know, normally I, I hit what I shoot at. Um, so I quite enjoyed Depper. Um, our drill pig was the late uh, Phil Fraser, um, a man I have great respect for. Uh, he had a bloody good sense of humor. And... Uh, later on uh, became an expert at firearms. So um, if during the war, for some reason, I had to go to the Morris Depot Armory, um, I would end up uh, talking to Phil because uh, we got on so well. Um, what was interesting about our squad was, okay, most of us were schoolboys, you know, XPE, uh, ex and Georges, and, but we were joined by a whole bunch of school teachers. These are all guys in their mid-twenties, and uh, they included the son of the then commissioner, um, Sharon, and uh, the guy's name was Anthony Sharon, who became best recruit. Now, not because he was son of the commissioner, but because um, we all knew that uh, he deserved it. You know, he was a, a leader of men and uh, uh, um, certainly deserved that. We passed out, I think it was end of March, uh, 1975, and our first station uh, was Concession. Now, Concession in March 1975 was the farming area was basically untouched by the war. So being a concession meant that uh, you were doing normal policing work, uh, peacetime in a, in a rural area, which included what we call the tea and cake patrols, um, head off on the Yamaha 350 with a trusty constable on the back and go and visit all the farms. Now, uh, as invariably the men were in the fields, you ended up with the wives and they would give you, they would give you tea and cake. So, you know, you come back at the end of the day and, you know, you don't feel like eating. <laughs> um, it wasn't really a happy station uh, concession. Uh, uh, 
I'll put that down to the member in charge. Okay, no names, no pectoral, but this guy, uh, I don't know, he was just a, a bully, you know, and he used his rank to make life uncomfortable. Um, one guy I did meet uh, at uh, concession, uh, our, our senior PO, two bar patrol officer, is the late Martin K. And Martin, great sense of humor, great guy, uh, uh, fancied himself as a bit of a cook. And for Sunday lunch, he would do a roast. And uh, the one Sunday, I recall, uh, we were sitting at the bar just just outside the, the mess, and the, uh, 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 Martin presented the roast. And as we came in, the mess cat was having a go at the roast, and Martin lost his temper, pulled his P1 and shot the bloody cat. The cat <laughs> pistol over the roast. Needless to say, we didn't eat the roast and went back to drinking. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> During that time, we uh, uh, were then asked to do a party patrol in the Chueshi, and uh, uh, because it's starting to come into the north of Chueshi from, uh, I think it was Centenary, Centenary East, and in the north of Chueshi there was a, 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 a support unit camp run by a support unit inspector called Julian Twine. So we first went there, and then Twine told us where to go, which was to ambush a certain path on the border between uh, Centenary and uh, Chueshi. Now, here comes our first incident of the war. We are lying there. It's a, uh, when was it? You know, it was a sort of April. Um, but it a cloudless night. It was a full moon, so there was pretty good light. And I am at the extreme edge of the ambush with the controls to a claymore mine that we had set up. And being on the extreme edge, and we obviously expected the guys to come in from uh, from Centenary, uh, uh, I would initiate the ambush. Uh, so midnight, thereabouts, I don't know. Um, I feel the hairs rise at the back of my neck. It's your instinct coming in. And yes, there was a little bit of noise on the path. And then you hear the sound of men walking. Uh, I see some shapes. And of course, you know, the finger starts on the initiator of the claymore. And uh, as the guys got closer, I saw they were offense. I thought, fuck me, what's going on here? What do I do? You know, is my first incident going to be a friendly fire incident? You know? So... I dropped the controls to the claymore, jumped up and just shouted, friend, 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 <laughs> to the surprise of my compatriots next to me. And I never for hear, forget hearing the sound of all those events coming around and being clicked off safe. It was a shitty feeling, you know. Um, but they realized what had happened. And yeah, it was an army call sign that had been deployed by Centenary. They didn't know we were there. And of course, we didn't know they were there. So what do we do? We light up, we make some tea. They start shouting at their jock. We start shouting at, uh, at Julian Twine. And uh, it, was a, it could have ended up quite tragically. So my first war experience wasn't exactly you know, what one expected, you know. But um, it's a learning curve, you know. You, it, it taught me something. Yeah. Um, shortly after that, uh, coming back to concession, I found out that I was being transferred. And um, I was being transferred to Mount Darwin. Uh, now, in Mount Darwin, when I arrived there, uh, uh, I was told that my duties wouldn't be that of a normal patrol officer, but I was to be the assistant to the uh, uh, BSAP jock officer of Mount Darwin. And jock officer in 1975, when I was there, were either Superintendent Fetzwaller or a Chief Superintendent, okay, can't remember his name. But um, the, the duties, the pretty basic office stuff, uh, dealing with traps and admin and such. But my role also was to be the QREP Ops. Uh, now that meant supplying all the GCSB bases 
in the Darwin Jock area with all their needs in terms of food, ammo, you bloody name it. And um, there are quite a few now, just going down the list of names, starting at Mary Mondra, Sambo, Rushinga, Dutito, uh, uh, Swan Base, uh, Swan Lake, uh, Mokumbura, uh, Chiswiti, etc. Uh, so there are quite a few bases to deal with. And of course, they will look to me for their food and their ammo and you name it. So um, I had a seven ton at my disposal and I sent it to Salisbury once a week. And they used to come back with fresh rations and rat packs, you name it. I had a, um, a storeroom, quite a large one, where I kept rat packs and scope magazines that were quite popular. Um, uh, and I also ran the armory, issuing ammunition to all and sundry. And suddenly I found I was actually quite busy every day, you know. I enjoyed my time there. But then I found out, being the junior man, uh, Edmond Darwin, myself and a, a guy called Graham Pagewood, were designated to be responsible for something that was called op Now, in 1975, when you got to Mount Darwin, when you, drive, when you turn off the main road, First, there's a police station, then there's a club, and then there's Fire Force. In, in, in 75, Fire Force was right in the center of Darwin. Yeah. And as it was then, after a successful contact, the, um, the choppers used to bring back the dead tours um, uh, in a net underneath the chopper. And then, oh, then the tours were brought across to uh, a slab that was uh, by the special branch officers. They were laid out. And in those days, the war was still what they called, the, the police was the primary uh, actor, not the army. And all the dead tours were fingerprinted, photographed. A docket was opened for each tour. And um, they, those dockets would then go back to Salisbury and they would try and link Chimarenga names, real names, see the guys, families, blah, blah, blah. Uh, thousands of man hours would be wasted doing that, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Um, but what Meshwitz was, basically, when they had finished with these guys, the tourists, the bodies had to be disposed of. And that was the duty of the two junior patrol officers, Grant Pagewood and myself. So, we used to load up these bodies into uh, our Land Rovers uh, and or a Land Rover, or sometimes if it had been a successful contact, several Land Rovers, and drive out to an old mine uh, in the Mont Darwin farming area, boundary Mont Darwin city in the east, and there was a shaft there. And we used to throw these bodies down the shaft, followed by several open tins of chloride of lime, in the hope it would disguise a smell, which it didn't. In fact, its own ecosystem developed by the mine shaft. You know, there was like two million flies there. And, you, you know, every time we arrived, they would disturb the flies. And this cloud, I've never seen this again in my life, this cloud of flies would rise out of the mine shaft and surround us, you know, which is annoying because they would get everywhere. And you know where those flies have been. So you didn't really want them anywhere near you. We both knew that this was a shitty job. Uh, we both knew that we could only do the job if we were a little bit drunk. So once we loaded up the bodies, um, we would go to the local store in Darwin and buy a half check of brandy or something like that and, and drink it. Because doing this job sober was, was a big no-no. Um, one incident was we nearly caused a riot. We, we had... Uh, we had just delivered a whole lot of uh, bodies to the mine shaft. It was a Saturday afternoon, and Centenary East Club wasn't too far away. And let me tell you, by the time you've thrown 16 odd bodies down that shaft, you stink like a dead man yourself. We walked into the Centenary Club bar, and immediately the bar emptied. Um, and there were shouts of protest from outside, you know, about how dare we, et cetera. So, yeah, we bought our beers and went outside and got sworn at. Um, but the problem was, is once you'd, you'd come back from this duty, uh, you had to take a uniform off, get it washed, take a shower, just try and get rid of that smell. And sometimes it took several days to get rid of it, you know. You always had this shitty smell in your nose. You know, and then the next...
Uh, to this will come. Um, thank God I didn't have to do it for too long, something like six weeks or two months. And then some more patrol officers arrived to were junior to me, so the duty was handed over to them. It must have been May, June. The member in charge, Mokumbura, got ill with malaria, and they needed a new member in charge uh, urgently. So I was sent up uh, to Mokumbura to be the new member in charge, which was nice. Um, now, we all know Mokumbura. Uh, where do I start? Okay, uh, my main duty was, I mean, in terms of crime, Mukumbura was really non-existent. Uh, the main crime was the brewing, the local brewing of kachasu, and Mukumbura was known for its kachasu, made from those yellow berries, uh, I forget what they were called, elephants used to eat. Um, but otherwise, my main duty was the running of the surf club. Now, in those days, uh, Mukumbura was quite a hive of activity. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry was there. They were just building the southern cordon sanitaire. So uh, all the engineers were there. Um, there were two troops of support unit, um, of course, in TEF. And uh, then there was Frilimo across the, across the road. So my main duty was the running of the surf club. And in the surf club, we had, there was no electricity there, we had four gas fridges whose sole duty was to keep the beer cold. Now, getting beer up to Mukas is not that easy um, because if you send it up on the normal resupply truck, there were so many corrugations in the road, and because of the heat, the beers used to literally explode and half the bottles would arrive useless. Now, the funny thing with Mukas was is, is that you as member in charge owned the beer stocks. So I had to go into debt to buy to buy the beers, and then buy the profits of mine as well. So uh, I came up with this plan. Um, it was purely by chance, actually. Um, we had a Gaia phone across the Mukumbura River, and it rang, and the local Frilima commander uh, asked for a meeting. So I went across and we met in the middle of the sand bed, you know, uh, and he didn't speak English, but very quickly indicated to me that I had no food. So here the trader in me comes out. I thought, okay, I'll give you food. And I believe, and I knew this to be true, they had a, a warehouse full of Manika dumpies. So um, we started this barter system where, uh, well, as often as they would let me, I would meet uh, the Frilimo commander uh, in the center of the riverbed, and I would give him maize meal, beans, sugar, salt, and he would give me Manika dumpies. So suddenly, the surf club became the only place in Rhodesia that was serving Manika beer. And Manika beer is not bad, you know. So it went down a treat. Of course, the trader and me are up the price. <laughs> Nobody could argue because it was the only cold beer in 200 miles or something. Um, so that side of it was sorted. Mukumbura. Okay, after a while, you went a little bit crazy. Uh, first of all, just outside the surf club, there was a radio mast. Now, come about 10 o'clock or so, guys would conduct races up to the crow's nest. Last guy into the crow's nest would buy the next round of beers. Now, how nobody ever fell off, I don't know, you know. Um, we had a, a swimming pool. The only swimming pool was at the DA's place. The water was black, it was smelly, but it was wet. So if you came back from patrol, you would have very fine guys in the pool just standing there in the black, stinky water with the cold beer. Uh, yeah. um, it was hot in Mokumbura, you know. Uh, I'm not this kind of guy to sort of sit around in the base. So we used to have these patrols up and down the court and sanitaire. So I joined these patrols, and that's where this picture with me in the MAG comes from, I carried an MAG, um, the weapon I rather liked at the time. Uh, I was sitting down in the 40 degree heat somewhere and I opened my water bottle, took a sip, put it down. And the next thing is I'm surrounded by a swarm of bees. Now these bees were thirsty and they were taking over the water. And every time I tried to go near my water bottle, the bees would become angry. 
So, you know, I had to abandon my water to let the bees drink, you know. Um, you also developed a bit of a funny sense of humor. Uh, a vulture eating a carcass in the middle of the court with the mines, you know, in between the two fences. And we watched this vulture, and he got fatter and fatter. So I shot into the air. So the guy took fright, and this heavy vulture is now running down. <laughs> the Gordon Sanitaire trying to take off, and of course, poof, there is this cloud of feathers. I was rolling on the floor. You know, nice sense of humor. Um, we were a very popular uh, target for senior officers coming to visit and spend the day. So the airstrip at Mukas was quite busy. And then she superintendents and colonels, et cetera, et cetera, used to come and visit. Um, and then with the one visit, it was a larger plane. And along came Zilla and her girls. And then Zilla put on a show for us in the, um, <laughs> in the surf club. Okay, uh, we'll censor what happened. But tricks were done with bottles, et cetera, yeah. Um, and uh, a nice evening was had by all. Yeah, and then uh, I think I stayed at Mukumbura for maybe two months. So we're now sort of August, September, uh, uh, back to Darwin, back to my normal duties. And really, in, in Darwin, you had a pub called the 234. The 234 was an old swimming pool. And the pub had been built in it. And of course, there were two places after hours where people would congregate. You had the pub of the uh, of the country club, and most of the army guys you'd find there. And anybody who was anybody in the police, you would find them from the member in charge downwards. You would uh, find them in the two, three, four. The member in charge then was uh, Inspector Mubi van Weyck, whom I would meet again later in Bike Bridge, but uh, I'll come to that. Number two was an S.O. Lotta. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, we would all meet in the two, three, four, and they would play silly games like dead ants. Somebody would shout a dead ants, and everybody had to roll on the floor. Um, God knows. Uh, it's a game I never participated in. Bok Bok, it was another story. Uh, I quite enjoyed Bok Bok being extra and bigger. Um, during the rainy season... The floor of the 235 filled up with water. So you were having your beer and standing in a foot of water, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, uh, the, the 234 was fun. CBD were there. And um, as QREP ops, I, uh, I found it quite important to be in with the CBD guys. Uh, so I used to supply them with ammo for, uh, from my armory for their SLRs in return. Um, if I needed spare tires or, or anything for the Land Rovers. I always got first call. And they had the best bra in town. So quite often, I would find myself in the evenings drinking cold beer with the CBD guys at their place. And um, yeah, it was basically meat and pup, which is what we had. Roll on Christmas. And by then, I have a nice regular girlfriend that comes and visits me from Salisbury over weekends. And uh, yeah, so life was quite comfortable. Um, and on Christmas Day, uh, there were two messes in, in, in Mount Darwin. And uh, the new mess and the old mess had a big colonial veranda. And on that, we set up a trestle table. And everybody in the BSAP attended that on the 25th. And we were just uh, starting to enjoy our meal. And uh, the constable from the charge office comes running up and tells us that CPU, Colored Protection Unit, have run amok. Now, CPU, their duties, they weren't frontline troops. They were there to guard bridges and places that were important to us. Um, and they got hold of some whitlets and uh, some boom, and they started running a mock in the, in the Mondawan township. So as POs, we left the dinner and went to the township. And uh, I go into one of the houses. And there is a CPU guy raping a woman and two other guys watching. And they are making the husband watch the wife being raped. Nice. 
Uh, so the one CPU guy turns to me with this vacuous smile on his face, sort of grinning. And um, I must admit, I put the flashlight of my FN into the grin. And it exploded into teeth, gums, blood, you name it. And yeah, we arrested all of them, took them back, and then the MPs arrived and sorted them. But it spoiled Christmas, you know. This, this, yeah, it wasn't the spirit of Christmas. Uh, and yeah, shortly after that, um, I took a, a, a month's leave. In retrospect, looking back at 1975, I'd spent a year in a war area and I hadn't fired a shot in anger, uh, which I found very disappointing, not knowing I would have plenty of chance in the years to come. But, but then it, it, was, it was a big disappointment to me. Um, so in January, uh, I went to Germany for a month. My parents gave me a ticket um, and uh, I basically caught up with the old family, etc. Roll on 1976. I come back from leave, uh, get to Morris Depot, and Mr. Danny Stannard approaches me and says, you're not going back to Darwin. You're going down to Bunch. And what had happened whilst I'd been in Germany, that uh, Kaunda had gotten Mugabe and Nkoma to a table because he couldn't see that there were two separate freedom fighter armies not really getting on and, 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 and each doing their own thing. And he forced them into a marriage called Zipa, Zimbabwe People's Army. Now, the inch that Mr. Stannard had was that incursions were going to come in the south of the country, um, uh, uh, maybe from Gonorizu area of uh, uh, Mozambique or uh, via Botswana. But they weren't sure. So, I was to go down, and uh, um, basically, we were 40 men uh, divided up into 10 man sticks. I headed the one stick, and then we were to patrol uh, both east and west of the road. Um, my patrol area, my unit's patrol area, was the Mtetengui TTL. Now, there were 10 day patrols. The, the Mtetengui is A, as flat as a pancake, and B, as dry as a bone. So to survive there for 10 days, you had to take 10 bottles of water. Now, that's pretty heavy. And because it's as flat as a pancake, the normal radius wouldn't work. So we had to lug a bloody TR-48. And anyone who's lugged a TR-48 knows it weighs a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we never saw anything or anybody. We just got extremely fit, um, very tanned, uh, and uh, very quickly found that uh, the TR-48, it just wouldn't communicate with my bridge. And the guy who used to take all our reports, sit traps, and relay messages was a call sign called, I think it was 266 Alpha, who was an Vukis farmer. Uh, and he, knowing the position we were in, he made himself available to us 24-7. Eh? Uh, I'll take my hat off to him. And Mubi van Veik was then member in charge by bridge. And the uh, what was interesting is... Uh, Underneath the bridge, there were guards, and our side was guarded by us, and their side was guarded by the SAP. And support unit, whilst I was there, got because up until then, support unit had brand guns only, got their first MAGs. Now, how they paid for them was with a trunk full of um, pornography. So MHEs for pornography is <laughs> how that one worked out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, aside from that, aside from becoming very fit, it, uh, it really not much happened. Um, what was nice is we then swapped and we then went on the other side of the river and we ended up on the Kaywoods farm. Now the Kaywoods farm, the house is right on the banks of the Umzingwani River and it is one of the most beautiful spots on earth because they, the, the river water is totally clear. You know, you, you can drink it. They had a beach there. And uh, I remember sitting there by the beach thinking, geez, 
who needs to go to Barra? You know, it was beautiful. Um, but again, not, nothing much happened. Got to know Liebig's ranch quite well, and the place is huge. Um, but uh, that was then the end of Barra. And uh, when did I leave there? I think it was May, end of April, early May. Went back to Salisbury, and then I was transferred uh, into Special Branch, into uh, and my first station was a place called Rosemba. <laughs> now, in uh, Rosemba is an old mission, and uh, uh, basically it is uh, a parallel row of, of buildings, of, of cottages, and at the end of the row is on the one side an old colonial style uh, uh, house, and on the other side being a mission, an old church which we used as a hall. Uh, and then at Jerusalem, there was a special branch. We had a bunch of reservists uh, to be our escort. And um, the units that, uh, the army units that were there basically came from the Midlands, from Guela. And they were 10 hour hour. Now the war started for real for me. And uh, it was Landman Alley. Uh, between Darwin and Rosembo, yeah. vehicles were constantly blowing up. And uh, the first time uh, I uh, I came under fire was a camp attack. Um, we were attacked, what uh, we then knew to be the Nyahui Detachment. Nyahui Detachment, Zanla was responsible for the area Marymount, uh, Rosembo, Rushinga. The Chesa had their own detachment. Yeah. And 30 kilometers north of the border is uh, the Ruya River, and uh, there is a small Zanla external camp there called Ruya Magazine. Ruya Magazine um, is basically a logistics, a resupply camp for uh, the uh, Nehanda and uh, Chaminuka sectors yeah. of Zanla. They, they divided the, the country up into sectors. Yeah. Um, and the Nyahui detachment uh, put up 50 guys, and they were joined by about 20 guys, a so-called heavy weapons detachment that came in from uh, Ruya magazine. And they consisted of uh, uh, um, one of those 7.62 rimmed cartridge. It wasn't Dragonov, it was a Dektorev uh, uh, heavy machine gun, the, the thing on wheels. Yeah, had wheels. Uh, uh, it had a uh, a shield. Uh, there was that. There was an uh, eighty-two mil mortar, and there were a couple of eighty ones. So, what I thought the fire was pretty heavy. I, I would, after that, later on in the war, uh, experience worse attacks, but it was bad enough. Um, they had designated. Uh, they wanted to, to to claim the base. They wanted to take the base over. So they had a, um, a unit, Zanda had a unit that was going to try and storm the base. Now, all we had was the cooks and bottle washers. We had one 81 mil mortar. Um, and I think there, there were like 20, 25 guys in camp. That's including my guys. So we had a few hairy moments there, but uh, eventually we, we managed to fight them off. Funny enough, no casualties out of sight. <laughs> Um, but they they then left, uh, and uh, that's that was the first attack. Now the guy in charge at uh, at December when I get there was uh, DSO Phil Harrison, and Phil had recruited a source that was going to rule my life for the next couple of years. Um, and this source was a walk-in that was interested that was interested in money. Now I will just describe later all about the running of sources and how sources were recruited, etc. But he was a walk-in. He was the cousin of the local detachment logistics officer. Was it security? I think it was security. So the cousin used to come in, visit the source, who was a teacher, and tell him all about the detachment and blah, 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 and what was happening. So... We got to know the Nyahui detachment pretty intimately. We knew they had uh, over 90 guys, so it was a big detachment as far as Zanla was concerned. Um, and 
they made areas like Marymount pretty unsafe. Even 1975, Marymount uh, was hot, was very hot. And uh, this led to my first contact. He got information that the detachment commander of the Nyahui detachment was going to call a meeting of a certain number of the section commanders at a certain call at a certain time. Again, cloudless night, good moon. So we deployed uh, by truck to uh, early evening to an area a little, quite a distance from the call and then walked in. So come midnight or so, we were coming into position uh, by the call. And there was a, a Pungui in progress. Now, you know what a Pungui is. Um, there's singing, dancing of Chimurenga songs, etc., and a big fire in the center of the crawl. So aside from the moon, the fire gave us pretty good light. So we now creep up <coughs> to the um, war stories. And we now creep up to the crawl. And uh, what we didn't know is the detachment commander who was in charge had set out guards, and we had kept past the guards. So the guards didn't know we were there. We didn't know the guards were there. Then one of the guards saw us and opened fire on us. And my first shot of the war was to kill the detachment commander. So you know, it was pretty good light, and uh, the distance wasn't too great. But then the shit hit the fan. Um, somebody, I'm right next to the hut, I'm not pinned down, and uh, somebody threw a fuss grenade into this hut. Now, a whole lot of women and children had run into this hut, and I couldn't move, and I had to sit there and listen. All these women and children burned to death. It's, uh, uh, it's something that's still with me today. You know, I have dreams about it. And I couldn't eat pork for months, because human flesh burning is just like pork, you know. Um, Right, come sunrise, two is a bombshell. Uh, and then we survey the scene. Um, we had some trackers come in by, by chopper. There, there was plenty of spore to follow up on. And we follow up on the spore. And now we we thought that all belickered, you know. Um, so we, we, we're now heading off on, on spore and now in this plant field and suddenly we come under fire from a copy to our right. And I just remember, like, like a ballet dancer, doing a few pirouettes. I didn't know where to put myself. But thank God we had a flanker out, and the flanker engaged uh, the tours that were firing at us, and they ran. We called in fire force, and uh, fire force then followed up, and it was a very successful contact. The one thing I remember after that contact, the sky had never been so blue, the right. birds had never sung so sweetly, and the cigarette never tasted so good. <laughs> um, so that was my first contact, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've just got a light to smoke. When Phil Harrison left, he left me in charge of the source, and I became the permanent presence in Rosembo and later Rushinga for the next two years. Yeah. And SB used to send out my boss, per se, who was either a DI or a DSO, and they used to come for a month and leave for a month. And the guy replacing Phil Harrison is a late Mike Crofter and a man I have the greatest respect for. Um, I learned a lot of tradecraft from Mike, and he was another bloke. He, Mike was fearless. He, uh, um, he would do anything to get the job done. Um, but they all respected the fact that I was running the sources. I had by then started to recruit more sources. And uh, uh, they just let me go down with it. And here I am. I just turned 21, and I'm doing my own thing, which I, which I enjoyed. You know, it's the type of guy I am. Uh, uh, and uh, we were having successes. The int was coming in from, from the source. We were deploying, and... Uh, uh, you got the killed. Um, right. Of interest is they uh, established a so-called no-go zone uh, uh, south of the cordon Sanité. I forget now how wide the zone was. It was either five or ten kilometers. And no one was allowed to live in that zone. Now, the result of that was 
And it was surprising how quickly it happened. <clears throat> the bush all grew back. And if you now go up in a plane, and there was a pro plane that used to come once a week, and I had to go up with it with a map. And you could now find infiltration routes because from the air, a path in the bush, it's just like a ribbon, it just shows up. And my role was then is to enter this, <laughs> this path on the map. The problem was, is to do that, the guy had to circle. And I used to get air sick. So I had to have a, a plentiful supply of bath bags whilst I was drawing in those paths. That was just a, another string to our bow, so to speak, you know, um, anything. Um, I learned very quickly, and this is basically drawing back on my days in the farm. I, I was never one of the guys who used to torture people. Um, and unfortunately, a few of my compatriots used to do so. Um, but if you go to a crawl and you sit there with the headman, and of course the guy's as hard as nails, you're not going to get anything out of him. But what you get out is what's around you. Yeah. For instance, is an inappropriately large amount of food being cooked. Yeah? Tells you something, doesn't it? Is an inordinately large amount of men's clothing being washed because they used to wash the, uh, the toes clothing. Um, where are the girls? I mean, if you, uh, the toes is they were in a base camp near a crawl, they're like their female company. So all the young girls from the crawl had to go and entertain them. So if you went to a crawl and you said to the headman, and of course he ain't going to tell you anything, but you can see there are no young girls in the compound. You know that the toes are nearby and you can put in OPs or ambushes uh, to suit, you know. So anything to get information, yeah. Um, in the end, we got to know the you Nyahui know, detachment so well, I knew them all by name. We even had their weapon numbers from, you know, from the context. We, we got the documents of the weapon numbers. So uh, uh, we were having some successes. Uh, Chesa, unfortunately, was, but okay, that's later, that's Rushinga. Um, once Puki had arrived at uh, Rushinga, um, uh, it it's, it's usually accompanied by an, an RL, and if Pookie picks up the mine, the engineers at the RL go down, lift the mine, and Pookie carries on. And then at the end of the trip in, in Marymount, Pookie dumps all the mines in Marymount for some reason, and then goes back to Darwin. And then sort of once a month, all the mines have to be taken back. And one day I volunteered and I took, well, it must have been 30 TM46s, the back of my Land Rover. And I remember driving back from Marymount, thinking, if I hit a tin now, that's it, you know. Um, but of course, it didn't happen. Um, you see, they, they used to plant the mines to as near the border as they could because they didn't really want to carry them too far into the country. So most of the mines were at Mukos, but uh, plenty of mines on that road between Darwin and, and Marymount. Yeah. Thank God for Pookie. One of the things they used to do, the local tribesmen, is if there had been a presence in the compound, they used to drive, uh, drive the cattle out at first light and then push them around the crawl to obliterate any spore. Uh, so we introduced what we call the cattle curfew. And uh, no cattle was allowed to be taken out of the enclosure. I think it was before nine o'clock or something. And uh, one day I decided, and this, it's my fault, that a certain cow had encroached on the curfew. I forget what the time was, but I shot the thing. Took it back to uh, December, and they, you know, we spit it, slaughtered the cow, and of, of course, being a hunter, I, I know all about butchering an animal, and um, put it on a spit. Ten hour I had a Portuguese cook. He made a gallon full of, uh, of baste, and uh, I had pickups that used to turn the spit. We made a 44-gallon drum of sadza, and the cook made a nice sauce. And it had, we ended up one of the best brides in all, uh, of my life. Because you could walk up to this cow and take out a chunk of meat as big as you wanted. Yeah? And then one of the guys had a guitar, and we had ourselves a sing-song. So, yeah, uh, 
we, we had our moments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah. That's fantastic, man. Uh, you're a great storyteller. And uh, I think we've got enough for one session. Um, okay. Um, and okay, I'm, because we then finish off Rosemba, and next session we do Rushinga. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Rushinga, um, it really hots up. <laughs> what's interesting for me is, is um, in 1975, I was I was also in Rosemba and in Rushinga. Uh, so we I'm, must have met. Well, you yeah, were tenor. Yeah, I was. No, I was a three commander uh, jock um, RLI. That RLI jock that was still in the town that you that you mentioned ne next to yeah. the next to the club. When yeah. the when the choppers were still on the football field, you know, yeah, before they built the new uh, the new airport and everything. Um, so yeah, no, uh, 1974, 75, um, uh, Mount Darwin, uh, Op Hurricane, um, Chesa, Chesa, you know, TTL and the purchase area, whatever it was, and and uh, Rusambo and Rushinga and all that <laughs> brings back lots of memories for me. Uh, well. <laughs> Um, next session, um, when I'm at Rushinga, we will cover Rushinga and Chesa in detail. 